Welcome back everyone, this is The Damage Report, I'm Johnny Rolla. It is going to be a massive show. We've got the media, the media inadvertently helping Donald Trump and the media doing everything they can to help Donald Trump. Seems similar, I'm gonna try to differentiate them. But later on, we have a candidate for the Tacoma City Council race, a very interesting platform there we're gonna delve into. Emma Vigeland of Rebel HQ is gonna join us to break down the big news of the day, including the revelation that Gordon Sondland is not going to be testifying today, thanks to Donald Trump's last minute intervention. We've got Ellen and George W. Bush, we've got all sorts of stuff. Ben Shapiro's got a new defense. For Donald Trump, it's a doozy, we're gonna break that down. And then if there's time, we're gonna close out the show with Meanwhile In. Did you know they're breeding massive pigs now? And South Park goes there with China. We're gonna be talking about all of that and more. But let's jump right into the news of the day, starting with Donald Trump and the media. Donald Trump wants us to communicate about this impeachment inquiry in a particular way. And so every day he brings out a couple new narratives. We can expect that, we know that's gonna happen. But it's on the media as to whether or not they're going to help him to signal boost those narratives without any sort of context being added, any sort of fact checking, anything like that. And unfortunately so far, they are really failing on that. And so I wanna give credit to Media Matters for doing a good job of taking a look at a couple of Donald Trump narratives and then seeing how they're played in the media. And I wanna talk about two here. So just a day or two ago, he tweeted this. Nancy Pelosi knew of all of the many shifty Adam Schiff lies, nice, weird anti-Semitism there, and massive frauds perpetrated upon Congress and the American people in the form of a fraudulent speech knowingly delivered as a ruthless con, he'd know. And the illegal meetings with a highly partisan whistleblower and lawyer. This makes nervous Nancy every bit as guilty as little Adam Schiff for high crimes and misdemeanors and even treason. I guess that means that they, along with all those that evilly colluded with them, must be immediately impeached. So. Weird names he just throws on to people, Nervous Nancy, I don't know why. Um, but Adam Schiff and Nancy Pelosi are uh, guilty of treason and should be impeached. So impeached at the very least, possibly executed because that is of course uh, one of the potential consequences of committing treason. So this insane, bat s crazy narrative that he puts forward, he just throws it out there on Twitter, which he's going to do. How does the media cover it? Well, the Washington Post, you know, the, the people who worry most that democracy dies in darkness, their headline says, Trump suggests Pelosi Schiff committed treason should be impeached. So not insanely suggests that they committed treason or suggests they committed treason, which they didn't because impeachment inquiries are entirely constitutional and in fact have happened in American history in the past couple of decades. No context added whatsoever. And we know that like 95% of the people that see a headline don't actually read the article. So all the Washington Post has done for the vast majority of their readership is let them know what Trump wants them to think, that's it. That's like just sending out a press release that Trump gave them. That's effectively what they've done in this case. But it's not just the Washington Post, Newsweek. Donald Trump slams nervous Nancy Pelosi in tweet storm accusing her of treason. So not only does do they just say accuse her of treason, not putting it in context of how crazy that is. They use the nickname that he wants you to think of Nancy Pelosi with. So they just signal boost that. And in fact, he slams nervous Nancy. That's what you put in the headline when you wanna imply that he was right to do this, he was strong and bold and alpha in doing this. So Newsweek doing a great job of serving as public relations for the president there. The Hill says Trump suggests Pelosi committed treason, should be immediately impeached. So that's the most benign version of this. But again, no sort of sense of journalistic responsibility to add context at all. Trump says something crazy, we make sure as many people see it as possible. And we add nothing, we don't wanna get involved after all. And so that's what they did with this. But this is not the first time that they've just done the work of the White House comms team. When Trump decided to follow in Fox News's footsteps and label this 100% constitutional impeachment inquiry as a coup, how did they respond to that? Well, the 11th hour, which is itself a show that's very critical of Donald Trump, tweeted out Trump lashes out calling impeachment a coup. In all caps, that in all caps is the most pushback I've seen against one of these things. But again, he just calls it a coup. And I know that Brian Williams in the show is gonna fight back against that, but in the tweet, just 
spread what the what Trump wants you to see. The Hill, Trump says he's becoming victim of a coup with a very concerned look on Trump's face there. Uh, let's see, the Daily Beast, Trump says the impeachment inquiry against him is a coup against American citizens. So it's not just against him, but anyone reading this tweet, you should be worried because it's against the American citizens. That's probably you, you should be very worried about this. And so great job by Media Matters by collecting some of these and I found some others on Twitter. This is not what the media is supposed to do. We know that they've learned very little with Donald Trump and how he manipulates the media. We know that they willingly rush to his defense when they don't need to, pursuing some sort of false mythical idea of journalistic objectivity. And we know that they've learned nothing about the role that the small captions in tweets and headlines play in driving what people think about the news. And so early on in this process, when I was talking about how concerned I was about the way it could play out, this is one of the major concerns that the media, the supposed liberal media that's so against Donald Trump is tripping over themselves to help him to shape the narratives around impeachment. I'm worried about that. I would argue that you should be worried about it as well. But let's turn now from the so called mainstream media to the more right leaning media and check in on how they're trying to deal with Donald Trump. We know that Donald Trump has been growing a little bit concerned about Fox News and their devotion to him. I mean, after all, they employ Chris Wallace and Shep Smith. These are hosts that have been critical of Donald Trump recently. And especially when it comes to this Ukraine story, they're willing to say it looks bad for him. On that topic, even both the Fox and the Friends, they have said a couple of times that it looks bad for him. Overall, they're defending him, but they've acknowledged that it looks bad at the very least. And recently, just yesterday actually, after it was announced that Donald Trump was gonna be pulling US troops out of Syria, allowing Turkey to go in and potentially massacre the Kurds that have helped us for so many years in Syria and Iraq and our conflicts in the area, they were very critical of him. Now, yes, they were matching a lot of elected Republicans who were also critical of the move, but even on Fox and Friends, again, they were willing to criticize Donald Trump. And that's the sort of thing that has frustrated him to no end in recent weeks. And it's perhaps why he's been looking for an alternative to Fox News. Now, we've been talking about this in the past, and I've often speculated that if he were to jettison Fox News, he either needs to start his own company and bring over Sean Hannity and Tucker Carlson, and Laura Ingram or whatever, or possibly go to OAN. But that's difficult and hard to imagine because it's one of the most amateurish media operations in literally the entire country. It turns out I was being a little bit obtuse. There's another option. It's not a 24 hour a day cable network, but there is a source of hard right, crazy conspiracy theory pushing media that he can rely on and he has started to rely on it. And that is Breitbart. You might have seen in the last week, he's tweeted out multiple Breitbart polls showing that only about 1% of the American public supports impeaching the president. I was shocked to find that out, so shocked that I didn't even feel the need to look at other polls. I just trusted what Breitbart said. But he's been doing that so much that even SNL has picked up on it. So here's a screenshot from their most recent episode with Giuliani there holding up a official Breitbart office poll, should Joe Biden be impeached? With 121% of the public saying yes, they should. So people are starting to get that Breitbart is his, I guess, last resort when it comes to quote unquote uh, journalism. And so I was curious about this and I decided to take a trip over to Breitbart and see, are they sort of getting that they might be able to step into Fox's place? Are they trying to appeal to the president or are they just doing the normal job of a right wing news media? Well, uh, I went and I looked at their most recent Breitbart news poll and was surprised to find out that in the question, should the DOJ investigate Joe and Hunter Biden, 96% say yes. That's exciting, I expect that Trump will be tweeting that out soon. And then that at least sort of is at least polling their audience. But they also try to just like directly appeal to Donald Trump. I found this as well, a Breitbart poll, do you still stand with President Trump with him giving a thumbs up? What is the purpose of that? Like, Can you imagine if MSNBC had that about Obama? They would be rightfully attacked over it. That is just designed so that when Trump goes to the website, he sees that and thinks, They've got my back, I like that. And so I decided, you know what, let's take a broader view. Let's just take a look as of this morning when I did my research, what is the front page of Breitbart? What can we learn about their strategy? So I loaded it up and here you go. Let's take a look at that. So you can see that on their trending topics, Ukraine witch hunt. So none of this 
looks kind of bad for him talk. None of this, oh, I don't know what he's gonna do talk. It is a witch hunt explicitly. NBA hearts communist China, forgetting of course that Donald Trump congratulated China on the birth of communism literally like 72 hours ago. So they've moved past that. Focahontas busted. They are using literally the nicknames that Trump wants to refer to Democratic primary contestants. And then just directly his latest tweet about Hillary Clinton, that's their front page news. Um, and so they've got, they've got his back there. Will Democrats impeachment push fail with a big happy uh, uh, picture of Trump at one of his rallies? And then if that all of that isn't explicit enough that this is about replacing Fox News as his go to media and getting that Trump bump on his Twitter. If you scroll down a little bit, I found two articles right up against each other. So take a look at this. So they quote Kill Me as saying, Northeast Syria pull out a mistake. Ooh, Trump, look at that. Trump even looks sad in that picture. Look at Kilmeade. He doesn't have your back. He's calling it a mistake. He's saying you're wrong. And then right underneath, one of their op ed writers says why President Trump should follow his gut on foreign policy. So look at this Kilmeade. This guy is turning on you, he's betraying you. We've got your back with our op eds. You should follow your gut. We're not even going to pretend that you should follow your brain because we know that that's Swiss cheese at this point. Follow your gut and we'll always have your back. And so, look, he's had a, a sort of weird uh, history with Breitbart. He attacked, you know, Bannon back in the day. Bannon, obviously, you know, instrumental in setting it up and all that, um, at least in the early years. And uh, but now they get that this is where the base is. This is where the right is. They want conspiracy theories and Trump defense. That's all they want, and they're going to give a better, more distilled, pure version of it than Fox News is currently uh, able to do. And I have a feeling that Trump is going to find that incredibly appealing. Okay, we're gonna take a short break. We come back, we're gonna turn to a candidate that's gonna join us, break down an important race after this. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. We turn now to the electoral war to get the right sorts of candidates at all levels of US government. And we're joined by a candidate for the city council of Tacoma, Courtney Love. Welcome to the Damage Report. Thank you for having me. Uh, glad to have you here. So uh, I wanna jump into the issues. Uh, tell me a little bit about your platform. What are the issues you're running on? Well, some of the local issues that are before us are the local LNG liquefied natural gas plant, a local ice detention center. They're trying to privatize our public broadband system, the first in the nation, second in size only to Chattanooga, Tennessee, and money in politics. I want it out. Okay, well, I, I certainly agree with you there. So some of the issues that you're bringing up uh, that, that you're focusing on at the, the city council level uh, also are being talked about quite a bit at the national level. Have you found that the national conversations around, for instance, maybe the Green New Deal is influencing how people are talking about this uh, LNG uh, plant or about you know potentially abolishing ICE you know, when you have a facility at the local level? Is that making it a little bit easier for you to communicate about these issues with your constituents or your potential constituents? It absolutely is. They're not always it 
it's not always the first thing on their list when I knock on their doors, but when we bring it up, it's uh, certainly something they oppose. So um, I was doing a little bit of research about the, the path up to the upcoming um, election, and it looks like in the, I believe at the primary stage, it was a fairly close race. What was that like? Uh, it was uh, worrisome. I try. I was worried, but I wasn't worrying. Uh, somehow I kept an upbeat uh, feel about the whole thing. It okay. was exciting to say the least. Yeah, I think at one point, I don't, I don't know if exactly how it shook out, but one of the articles I saw said that at one point it was uh, up to about four votes difference, which is about as that close was, as elections get. Yeah, that was the narrowest and it landed with a 13 vote spread. Okay, okay, oh, well, then that's a wide that's a wide range then, you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> oh yeah, um, yeah so, it's easy peasy. <laughs> uh, you, you said that you're part of the Bernie Kratz Coalition. Uh, for people who might not be familiar with it, uh, what, what is uh, the coalition about? Well, the full name is Our Revolution, Washington Bernie Kratz Coalition. And we started uh, in opposition to the superdelegate issue here in Washington. So, uh, we have 17 superdelegates and 16 of them voted for Hillary Clinton. Uh, the other abstained, and but the state went 73% for Bernie Sanders. Oh, wow. So yeah, so we were objecting to that process and we've just evolved into a vetting and candidate support group. And uh, we share different uh, resolutions with each other to put forth through our own legislative districts. And we are supporting uh, candidates at every level of government. So you're, you're a part of that coalition, but also in a broader sense, um, you're running based on a desire to create and use coalitions to sort of achieve positive change. Um, what is that gonna be like? I mean, you're, you're coming from a particular part of the party um, and you might find yourself having to try to appeal to either Republicans or more centrist Democrats. What, what is that process like? Well, <laughs> It's difficult, uh, people will say, "Oh, I agree, these things are bad, but, and that's when we talk about money and politics. Okay, and, and so, so how are you bringing, I've heard you know, some of the presidential candidates communicating about money and politics in a particular way. I know it's becoming increasingly common for candidates to reject um, you know, like big corporate donations, PAC donations and things like that. Um, how are you bringing it into this city council race? What, what, what aspects of money and politics are you focusing on? Well, Seattle, just to the north of us, uh, we're very lucky to have a local example of this. They have a voucher system, and so I'd like to replicate that here in Tacoma. And so what I'm discussing what we can do locally to do something that needs to be done nationally. Okay, I think that experimentation in that way uh, is a great idea. Uh, are there any other examples of that where you're looking to um, bring some of the experiments that are being done in, in potentially in progressive areas of policy and bring them into the t t Tacoma area? Uh, election reform and uh, are, are the main ones. Uh, the Green New Deal is a big one. I'm a big fan of permaculture, mm -hmm. which is a agricultural system that reduces your inputs, be it fossil fuels or time or energy, and uh, maximizes your uh, output, which is harvest. And I'd like to see food security locally in Tacoma, and uh, especially in the uh, sight of the coming climate crisis. I agree, those sound like great issues. Um, and so finally, I'm interested, it, it seems like in the past few years we know in the midterm elections there was a big turnout. People seem more involved in what's going on and wanting to get involved. Are you expecting that that's gonna be replicated at the city council level? Um, how are you attempting to, to get people to see that what happens at the city council level has ramifications at the higher levels as well? Having such a close primary race really helps uh, share the example that uh, every vote counts and to be involved in this process. But we are, we have one of the lowest voter turnouts in our county and in Washington state and it is disheartening and I uh, discuss local apathy. And while we're, we're also very blue collar, so uh, given that we have a slightly higher in proportion union base mm -hmm. and I'd like to see more organizing done through that. If we're blue collar, we should be organizing as such. Okay, and uh, where can people find out more about your candidacy? Uh, electcourtneylove.com. Okay, Courtney Love. And my Facebook page, which is the same. Awesome, well, thank you, Courtney. Uh, we really appreciate you coming on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. We're gonna take a short break here. When we come back, uh, Emma Viglin of Rebel HQ is gonna be joining us to break down some of the big news of the day.
Donald Trump's rollout of his shift in strategy towards Turkey, the Kurds, and Syria yesterday. Uh, not the smoothest necessarily. I think it's fair to say that it was widely panned, perhaps especially from those on the right, which I don't think is what Donald Trump expected. And now, one day after, we're learning more about how this actually came about and how he's attempting to salvage this policy change. Uh, we're joined now uh, by reporter for Rebel HQ, Emma Viglin, to comment. Emma, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, John. Uh, great to have you here. So I, I've got a little bit of information, uh, but I want your, your initial impressions. I, I don't think anyone was expecting this big change where he was gonna pull the troops out and potentially allow for some sort of military action or massacres against the Kurds. When you saw that, what, what was your first reaction? My first reaction was, okay, this is a complex international situation and I do respect the inclination to just kind of get out of our Middle Eastern wars. But when you look further into it, it's actually a disastrous decision. And I think it really illustrates something you've been talking about for a while or in, in conversations that we've had. The difference between right wing isolationism uh, of Tucker Carlson and Donald Trump, which in, in its outset is actually very mean spirited and the leftist uh, view of trying to get us out of these wars because Trump is really just stabbing our allies in the back as opposed to coming at it from the principled stance of, oh, we want to save our resources and our tax dollars so they can go domestically towards Medicare, towards college for all, mm -hmm. towards all of these things. Really, what Trump wanted to do was just uh, cow to an authoritarian leader in Erdogan who basically asked him for a favor. And he didn't really care that the Kurds had helped us in our fight against ISIS. He chose to uh, discard them like a used tissue. And uh, as a result, Turkey, according to reports, has already begun operations of trying to uh, go into northern Syria and basically attack the Kurds yeah. as a direct result of the, the disastrous decision by Donald Trump. Yeah, and so like you say, it's complicated. Uh, we want to get out of there. There was no reason for us to be involved in the first place. But the last thing we want to see is the Kurds who fought for years and years and years and been betrayed by the US over and over and over get massacred. And there are some people in these sorts of situations that always jump in and start to spread this sort of shallow false dichotomy that you either are totally fine with the massacres, or if you have a problem with that, then you want to invade Syria with 100,000 troops or whatever, which is of course not what's going on. There is a middle ground there. And in fact, the way that this came about appears to, to sort of get into that. So just briefly, um, how did this come about, this change in US policy? Uh, Sunday's phone call between Trump and Erdogan, uh, you know, leader of Turkey, was held to try to ease the Turkish leader's fury that he didn't get a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Trump last month on the sidelines of the United Nations General Assembly, according to three current and former officials. So Erdogan there with a very Trump-like uh, hissy fit. Sunday's phone call didn't go as expected, according to officials. Erdogan was adamant about Turkey going to Syria. Even Trump's offer of a White House visit wasn't enough to deter him. Trump told Erdogan that a moderate incursion, such as clearing out a safe zone, would be acceptable. So it's not just we either have troops or we don't. Trump is giving the okay to attacks against the Kurds. And that's the part that I find most worrying. It's, a, it's not just like sort of by our leaving, he's allowing them to be attacked. He's saying it's okay if you want to attack them. And this isn't just letting sovereign nations be sovereign nations. Turkey is a major United States ally with a huge history of respecting our wishes because we have a lot of investment in their country and they need to, they know that we have a lot of influence and we have a relationship with them. So uh, Trump months before basically said that uh, he would go after Turkey and Erdogan if they chose to, to go after the Kurds. And now he's completely reversed his position based on one phone call with Erdogan, which is a part of a larger pattern of his reckless decisions to do whatever these right-wing authoritarians want after having conversations with them. We have Putin, we have Benjamin Netanyahu, we have Jair Bolsonaro, Brazil, we have Modi. Uh, we yeah. have a variety of other right-wing dictators and or, or at least at the very least authoritarians who uh, Donald Trump seems to feel very at home with. And now we can add Erdogan to that list. Yeah, yeah, and I don't, like the, the phone call with Erdogan, 
I don't know what it would look like if you had a president who is actually some sort of expert at the art of the deal. But it definitely wouldn't like look like what came out of that phone call. And just briefly, we didn't cover his you know great and unmatched wisdom thing yesterday. But he's continued to communicate around this. And so I just want to give you his updated response to all the criticism he's been getting. He tweeted, we may be in the process of leaving Syria, but in no way have we abandoned the Kurds who are, very, who are special people and wonderful fighters. Likewise, our relationship with Turkey, a NATO and trading partner has been very good. Turkey already has a large Kurdish population and fully understands that while we only had 50 soldiers remaining in that section of Syria and they've been removed, any unforced or unnecessary fighting by Turkey will be devastating to their economy and to their very fragile currency. We're helping the Kurds financially and with weapons. So once again, threatening the Turkish economy, pretending as if he has no idea what the relationship between the Turkish government and the Kurds in general has been historically. And sort of implying that on the one hand, he's giving the okay to attack the Kurds. And on the other, he's arming the Kurds potentially against Turkey. I don't well, know. He may, he may not know, John, about the actual historical relationship. But but the fact that he mentioned how few soldiers were actually there just bolsters the point that withdrawing them is giving Turkey the okay. Because we are allies, Turkey, even if it was very few troops, did not want to cross that red line in that sense, because there was a very small troop presence from the United yeah. States there. So, so that just goes to show that that uh, this was a very just go ahead and and stab our allies in the back and attack them. And it's notable to note that um, notable to note that <laughs> the Kurds are a minority group and a lot and they are getting it from both sides from Assad who has discriminated against them and gone after them as the leader of Syria and now with Turkey. So the Kurds are in a really difficult situation right now as a result of the actions of Donald Trump. Yeah. And again, that that false dichotomy, it's not, you know, we either like have the massacres or we invade. You could pull those 50 people out. And I would love to see no US troops in Syria as part of a large ironclad commitment from Turkey that in exchange for something, they're gonna take no military actions against the Kurds. That's not what he did, but that is a great way to pursue peace, but not allow human rights violations to occur unchecked around the globe. Sure, John Wardarola. Exactly. That's gonna stick, I'm a little bit worried about that. Okay, let's turn now to another important piece of news that broke earlier today. Uh, Donald Trump announced that the planned testimony of Ambassador Sondland, uh, one of those cited in the really damning text that came out in this Ukraine scandal, um, is not going to happen. He blocked it from happening and he announced this by tweeting, I would love to send Ambassador Sondland, a really good man and great American to testify. But unfortunately, he would be testifying before a totally compromised kangaroo court where Republicans rights have been taken away and true facts are not allowed out for the public. To see, importantly, Ambassador Sondland's tweet, which few report, it wasn't a tweet, it was a text, and many people reported, that's why you're scared. Anyway, quote, I believe you are incorrect about President Trump's intentions. The president has been crystal clear, no quid pro quos of any kind. That says it all. Okay, Emma, so um, when people saw that text message, they believed that it came about as a result of coordination with the president. Him tweeting it seems to seal that deal. What do you think about this communication, but also uh, Sondland not testifying today? Well, even if it wasn't a direct coordination with the president, Sondland is not dumb enough to 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 say, "Oh, it is a quid pro quo in in the text." Mm -hmm. He knows that if this was some sort of dodgy situation, that he would need to cover his tracks, and that and that's exactly what this what this is, in my view. Um, this is really old school Nixonian politics, right? And it, it seems like a man who is very cornered. He has to have seen the poll numbers that came out today that nearly 60% of Americans support impeachment, which is a, a almost 20 point, 15 point flip from just July. Because this Ukrainian issue is way more clear cut than anything we saw with Russia. Uh, it, it, it's obviously illegal. They, he was trying to leverage taxpayer money that normally goes to, to the Ukraine for his own political ends. Mm -hmm. And so that message is resonating. And I think that that's why we're seeing this panic from Donald Trump at this current moment. And as a result, that's why he's trying to block this testimony from happening. And Giuliani's doing the same thing, right? He's that's refusing to go in front of Congress. So it's, it seems as though they're coordinating in, the, in that respect. 
Yeah, I mean, so far, no, no, you know, cooperation from those two. You rightfully pointed out that this is like a Nixonian strategy. I actually, I didn't really pay attention to history. I don't remember how that worked for Nixon. But what do you think about this as a strategy? I mean, some, including Lindsey Graham, have made the case that obstructing an impeachment inquiry is itself grounds for impeachment. So this seems like a bold strategy. Do you think that it's possible that the Democrats? might simply fold, that they won't actually exercise other means of forcing them to testify? Well, the Democrats folding is always a very real and often probable possibility. But I do think that people like Pelosi who are poll watchers and notoriously scared to do anything that they may perceive as politically risky are going to be emboldened by these outcoming poll numbers. And the fact that the American people are largely pretty outraged about what they're seeing and what was revealed by this whistleblower. So I do think that that's the silver lining in terms of how the Democrats are going to respond to this. But in terms of a strategy from Trump, for their ends, I think it's a good one. Donald Trump has gotten away with a lot and Republicans in general have gotten away with a lot by just blowing past it and being arrogant and brash and saying that it doesn't matter and doing whatever they need to do to avoid scrutiny. and. That seems to be the tried and true method that he's going with this time around. He doesn't really have another option. Is he going to admit wrongdoing? That's not in his DNA. <laughs> and honestly, in the United States of America at this current moment, lying and just get, saying that you didn't do anything wrong and being, you know, puffing out your chest, it's worked. And uh, hopefully the Democrats can see through that. Hopefully, and hopefully they'll actually exercise some sort of legal recourse. But you know, we'll have to see. They they have subpoenaed Sondland. We will see if that will be enough to get him to testify. Uh, okay, uh, Emma, if you can stick around, we're gonna take a short break and come back. Uh, Ellen, under a little bit of pressure, we'll see how she responds after this. I'm friends with George Bush. In fact, I'm friends with a lot of people who don't share the same beliefs that I have. We're all different, and I think that we've forgotten that that's okay that we're all different. When I say be kind to one another, I don't mean only the people that think the same way that you do. I mean be kind to everyone. So that is Ellen on her show responding to the huge amount of criticism that she got for appearing next to former President George W. Bush at some sporting events like football or rugby or I don't know, something like that. Cricket, I don't know. John. <laughs> something like that. The Dallas Cowboys. It's the NFL. Dallas, yeah, yeah, the NFL, whatever <laughs> that stands for. So, um, Emma, uh, I've seen that you've been tweeting about this. Um, what do you think about the criticism that she faced? And what do you think about her response as well? It's sad because she's at her heart, I think, a good person. But this is what happens when you're a wealthy elite that's pretty disconnected from the realities of regular people. Uh, George W. Bush started an illegal war that killed hundreds of thousands of Iraqi civilians needlessly. He did many things, including basically leave New Orleans uh, to, to die. And that is the city that I think uh, Ellen DeGeneres is from. So she should maybe have some reflection on, on, on that fact. Um, and this is a lot of, in a lot of ways, the derangement of, of the Donald Trump era, where we look back on everything with rose colored glasses, when if you just have some sort of perspective taking, you can realize that the Bush administration days and, and those times when he's, he spurred a, a recession and, and uh, again, led us into an illegal war, those were some pretty dark times, even though he may seem very folksy and like a nicer guy when you have a one on one interaction with him yeah. than the, the clammy hands Donald Trump. Exactly. Uh, my, so I, I didn't, I don't think I even originally saw it until she responded, but my biggest issue with it is her response to the criticism because she's not, in my view, responding to what people were actually concerned about. She has created a straw man that is easy to defeat. It's easy to tie into her brand of let's all dance and be happy and everything. People are not saying don't sit next to people who disagree with you. It's not about thoughts or beliefs, it's about actions. It's not that he hypothetically likes wars, it's that he led one, he started one. It's not that he's 
against gay marriage, it's that he tried to stop it from happening. He chose Supreme Court justices who would make it so that it didn't happen. She keeps talking about beliefs and thoughts when it's the actions that he actually took. Like, are we exactly. supposed to sit, like, we're, we're supposed to happily sit next to murderers just because we have different views on killing? No, they killed people. It's the actions that are an issue. Yeah, and, and the problem is, is that she's been isolated from those actions largely as a very wealthy person. When it comes to gay marriage, she certainly wasn't. So that's also shocking that she hasn't at least been reflective on that point. Um, and, you know, I've admired the fact that, for example, she's called out Caitlyn Jenner's terrible politics despite being a mm. member of the trans community and that she's been aggressive on that front. So that's what makes this um, perplexing and sad. And I, I really just think it goes back to the fact that what you were saying, John, when you're a, a wealthy person who has a lot of privilege and you've been wealthy for a really long time, the effects of politics are largely insignificant to you. And so she can look back uh, on the Bush administration with nostalgia and she can uh, think that his actions are, are limited to the way that he treats her in Jerry Jones's box uh, down, in, down in Dallas. Yeah. That's not what it is. The actions are far reaching. They affected hundreds of millions of people throughout the world and he is a war criminal. And so as someone who wants to be spreading positivity in this world, and that's I think what she would state her mission is, she has to look beyond the micro interactions with these politicians and look at the effects of them. Because politics, it's, 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 not, a, an, it's not an atheist position to, to do that. She's making a moral stance in that sense. Exactly. Okay, let's turn to one more topic. We only have a couple of minutes, but I was curious about your thoughts on this. Uh, the defense of Donald Trump on this Ukraine scandal have come in many forms. Many of them I don't think really qualify as uh, defenses and a lot of them are intellectually dishonest. A good example of potentially both of those wrapped into one. And that is uh, Ben Shapiro's most recent defense of why we shouldn't think that what Donald Trump did was some sort of criminal conspiracy here. When it comes to scandals, when it comes to President Trump came up with a plan, the plan was Deploy Rudy Giuliani to uncover the specific corruption of Joe Biden and then leverage the Ukrainian government to help Rudy Giuliani to go after the specific corruption of Joe Biden because the man, he has a gimlet eyed, sharp eyed, steely, steely missile man eyed plan. He, he is just going to carry that. Here's the best defense. No. Right? That's the best. The best defense is no. You got to be kidding. No, that's this is not a dude with a plan. Okay, so before you ask, I don't know what a steely <laughs> misaligned man is. Um, and I don't think that your defense of Trump makes more sense just because you purposefully deepen your voice so it sounds like a regular boy. Um, it, like the idea that he's too dumb effectively to come up with crimes, that strikes me as a weird thing for a Trump uh, supporter to use as a defense of him. Yeah, I mean, Shapiro is always trying to put himself above regular Trump supporters by making him out to himself out to be some sort of intellectual in that realm when in reality he's as much of a conservative loon and an emotional reactor that uh, as the rest of these Trump supporters. Um, like, is he trying to say that Donald Trump is incapable of basic human cover-ups? Because these aren't, first of all, what he's done Donald Trump is not very complex in itself with yeah. Rudy Giuliani. Like he's trying to make it seem like this is a grand master plan that actually has some sort of sophistication when this is the most basic thing that a 13 year old would do to hide weed in his room. It's really <laughs> not that hard, right? And, and, and or to when your parents catch you drinking when you're 16 or whatever like that, it, it, it's a reflexive lie. Yeah. All of these cover ups are not schemes. They're just knee jerk reactions and getting his little pawn pieces to do what he needs them to do. So he, it, it is a straw man in that sense. Shapiro is trying to make it seem like it's this master plan when in reality it's a very dumb, again, reflexive cover up. Uh, so I wanna thank you for mining your own experience for cover ups to apply to everyday <laughs> politics. Um, I, I like that added touch to the news and, and I agree. <laughs> I don't even know 
I don't know if Ben Shapiro's heart's really even in it. He talks for hours a day. I don't know if he's even paying attention to what he says, but I, I don't doubt that it'll work for a certain percentage of his base, which is probably Trump's base. Um, you know, they'll, they'll cling to whatever seems to get Trump out from under the pressure that's building on him, even if they then jettison it to say that later on he's some sort of genius who's setting a perfect trap for the Democrats to fall into. If this blows over somehow, he's going to then claim that Donald Trump is really intelligent in other ways when he basically the best defense he had for his president is that he's too idiot to come up with a large scale plan. Exactly, and for once we found something that he has in common with his son. Anyway, <laughs> uh, talking about Trump there. Anyway, uh, Emma, as always, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, everybody should go check out Rebel HQ to see more of your work. Thanks so much, John. We're gonna take a short break here. We come back, meanwhile in news from around the world. And now it's time for news from around the world and meanwhile in. In China, they are breeding giant pigs. And depending on which media source you go to, you might get a different comparison. Here you can see they're as big as polar bears. Other sites are saying as big as Chevy Sparks, as big as microhomes. Anyway, they're, they're really big. How big? Well, one is 500 kilograms or 1100 pounds. And uh, slaughter of some of the pigs can bring as much as uh, equivalent of $1,400, over three times higher than the average monthly disposable income in that particular area. And this sort of development isn't just a necessary sort of financial development, but also because African swine fever is apparently decimating the nation's hog herd in half by some estimates. And so pork prices are going up, making it even more appealing. But the thing is, while this is of course exciting and look, as big as a polar bear, I certainly prefer to an actual polar bear, they are still pigs and there's lots of research out there they might be really uncomfortable to look at, but they're apparently really intelligent, emotional, social, and even sensitive animals. Even if they're really big, like we should probably think twice about eating them. I'm just saying. Anyway, meanwhile in. Meanwhile in Sweden, Greta Thunberg might get the Nobel Peace Prize. A number of bookmakers in Europe and Betfair, which operates the largest online betting exchange in the world, show the odds overwhelmingly in her favor to become the next recipient of this prestigious honor. And interestingly, it's not like they commonly pass it around based on stances or work having to do with climate change. If Thunberg is successful, she'd be the first to receive the award for efforts addressing climate change since Al Gore got it back in 2007. Which is crazy. Now, I don't really have much to say about this. It's, she's awesome. It'd be good news if she got it. I think it would be inspirational to young people around the world. I know there's a lot of other great candidates, but she really has been fighting against some long odds to get people to focus on this issue. So go, Greta. Meanwhile, in. <music> Meanwhile, South Park is canceled. It's been a long time coming. And it's just in China, but it has to do with their most recent episode. So uh, let's take a, take a look at why China was so incensed at the most recent episode. That's banned in China. Uh, it features a pair of storylines critical of China. One involves Randy, the father, getting caught attempting to sell weed in China and getting sent to work at a work camp similar to those uh, Beijing is using to um, uh, do their re-education of uh, Muslims and other uh, outgroups in China. Uh, while he's at work, by the way, he runs into an imprisoned Winnie the Pooh, which is a nice reference to the fact that Winnie the Pooh was censored as well when he was compared to the leadership of, uh, of China too. There's a second plot line following Stan, Jimmy, Kenny and Butters forming a metal band, which becomes popular and attracts the attention of a manager who wants to make a film about them. But then the script keeps changing so that the film can safely be distributed in China. Now I know how Hollywood writers feel, Stan says at one point. So they didn't like any of that, I think, and so government censors uh, lashed back. They deleted virtually every clip, episode, and online discussion of the show from streaming services, social media, and even fan pages. So it has been stripped from the internet, leading to a really interesting statement from uh, Trey Parker and Matt Stone, who said, like the NBA, we welcome the Chinese censors into our homes and into our hearts. We too love money more than freedom and democracy. Xi doesn't look like Winnie the Pooh at all. 
Tune into our 300th episode this Wednesday at 10. Long live the great Communist Party of China. May the autumn sour gum harvest be bountiful. We good now, China? I don't think I don't think they're good now. But I do like them being willing to, to take on this censorship. It's been a long time coming. There was that NBA uh, scandal, obviously, where uh, they were so frustrated by like a single solitary social media post. But also Hollywood going into contortions to make sure that their movies will be sellable in China. I mean, I'm not saying it's necessarily on any individual filmmaker to deal with government censorship in China, but I think that we need to coordinate at least a little bit to push for positive change there. Okay, that is unfortunately all the time that we have. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for watching. If you haven't already reviewed the podcast, as always, please do that. I look forward to reading those reviews uh, every single day. Uh, thank you so much for joining uh, both me and the candidates and Emma today. Uh, lots more planned for the rest of the week, so I'll see you with JR tomorrow. Marriage one is bad. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.